It was Sunday morning, December 7th, 1941, and any time that you hear that specific date, uh, something comes to mind. In fact, uh, President Roosevelt said that is a day that will live in infamy. My dad was 20 years old on December the 7th. He had turned 20 one month earlier, and he was on duty that morning in Pearl Harbor. Now, when he and his partner came to duty that morning, they were not down in the harbor. They were up on the, the side of the hill, and there was an anti-aircraft gun that was mounted there. And that anti-aircraft gun where my dad was stationed that morning was fixed, and it was pointing over the mountain there. It would only turn just a few degrees to the right and a few degrees to the left because everyone thought they had planned if there was an attack, it would come over the backside of the island and over the mountains so that they couldn't be seen. But the Japanese had done their homework. They flew in low over the water. And Dad had to stand there and watch 18 ships get destroyed. 200 aircraft either destroyed or damaged. 2,400 soldiers, many that he knew by name, killed. 1,300 wounded. He didn't like to talk a lot about that. He said every time he thought about it, it made him sick to his stomach. But the Japanese miscalculated on something. It was actually a blunder on their part, politically and psychologically. Because you see, the, the next morning when everyone got up, a nation had woke up, a nation that had up until that point kind of thought, yeah, there's a war going on, yeah, we think that, no, nah, we're, we're not going to get involved. We're just going to let them handle it. Not on Monday morning, December 8th. There is told that there are lines after lines, streets just filled with people at the recruiters' stations, volunteers ready to join and serve. You see, a nation had woken up, and they were willing to serve. They were going to fight for their freedoms. It is said that there are those that were teenagers that were below the age of serving that lied about their age. There were also the other end, those that were middle-aged that were over the top end of serving, but they lied about their age so that they could go and serve for their country. Those that had conditions would lie about their condition, but it's said that there were many that walked out of the recruiter station who were told, you cannot serve. Grown men walk, walking out weeping because they could not serve their nation. Women served. Women poured in to serve in support roles of making uniforms and mending parachutes and even making airplanes. You remember Rosie the Riveter and all those posters. Interesting, though, as a nation woke up in 1941 and celebrated in 1945 the end of a war and welcomed their troops home. 25 years later, it's a different story. 25 years later, it was a war that no one wanted. A war that no one, not many, wanted to serve in. No one was knocking down the doors at the recruiter's office to go to Vietnam. In fact, it was so badly served that the United States had to implement the draft. 
And so there were those that were enticed from a draft standpoint to serve in a war that they did not want to serve in. They wanted no part of. There were some that left the country when their number came up. And so much different than 1945, our Vietnam vets were not welcomed home. In most cases, or let's just say many cases, they were looked down upon. Very few had anything to do with them. No celebration, no thank you for your service. Now, when it comes to the local church, these two models actually work. Because you see, in the local church, often what happens is it are, it's those that can't wait to serve. In fact, they'll go to the leadership and they'll say, God has blessed me with this gift, and I want to serve. Tell me where I can serve. I can't wait to serve my Lord and Savior. And then there are those on the other end of the spectrum that say, nope, I don't want to serve. I'll just watch from afar. Years ago, we had a member, a, a couple in our church that used to attend for a number of, number of months, and they disappeared, so I called them, and here's what they said. We're going to a mega church now. I said, really? I said, was there something that they offer that we don't? Yeah, you, you, I'd love to hear why you did that. And here was the answer. Your church is smaller, and we can't hide, and we're expected by what you're saying is to be involved in some way because we've got these gifts. But at the mega church, we can go in and we can sit down and we can hide and no one knows we're there and we can get up and we can leave and we've done our worship. That was a quote. They've checked off worship for the day. Christ set an example and he commanded us to serve. It doesn't matter how old or young you are. It doesn't matter your condition. You say, well, wait a minute. So before I read the scripture that I want to preach on this morning, I want you to hear this. If you are mentally capable of forming thoughts, then you can serve. And let me give you an example. I read a story last week about a young man who had a horrific accident. And the accident left him a quadriplegic. And his pastor was visiting him in the hospital, and he was crying. He said, Pastor, I'll never be able to serve my Lord again. And the pastor said, Yes, you will. He said, here's what I want to do. I want to give you a prayer list every week, and I want you to be the one that assimilates that out to the prayer team. And so I want you to pray, and I want you to help others pray. And the pastor said, a few weeks after he had gotten out of the hospital and after he had begun this ministry, his wife brought him into his office in a wheelchair, and the guy was just crying. And he said, Pastor, I'm never more alive than I've ever been before in Jesus Christ because you gave me a way to serve. And God is blessing me for it. Don't say, nope, can't do it. I'll watch from afar. We're going to look at this spiritual discipline of service this morning. Last week, we looked at the spiritual discipline of worship. And so we have been going through these spiritual disciplines over the summer through this uh, uh, sermon series. And so today is about service. You'll say, well, this sounds boring. Well, I hope it's not. Um, I hope that the Holy Spirit in some way will help you get what 
he wants you to get out of his word. So if you want to follow along, or the screen, they'll be on the screen if you want to follow there. But we're going to read a few passages of scripture. The two gospel passages will be where I'm actually preaching from, but I wanted to give a couple of other verses this morning in this idea of the discipline of service. So the first is Malachi, Old Testament, last book of the Old Testament. This is chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. They will be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I prepare my own possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. So you will again distinguish between the righteousness and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. Last week, I read from Matthew 4.10, and I'm going to do that again because it serves both disciplines. You'll see why. Then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan. This is during the temptation portion of his beginning ministry. Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God. And then the last part of that verse, And serve him only. From Mark's Gospel, the 10th chapter, verses 43 through 45, read this way. But it is not this way among you, but whomever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man not, did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And then finally, from John's Gospel, the 13th chapter, these verses beginning in verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he would come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from the supper and laid aside his garment. Taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part of me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. Listen to what he says now. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garment and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I give you an example that you also should do as I do to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you are our strength and our redeemer. I pray, Father, this morning that you would illuminate our hearts and minds for what you would hold for us through this, your holy word. We pray this in your name. Amen. 
Jesus and his disciples were gathering in the upper room in Jerusalem. This would be the third time that he would gather with them to celebrate the Passover feast. And the disciples, even at this point, had very little clue about what was taking place. They knew that he had been teaching. He, they knew what he had been saying. They still did not get it. As they entered and began to go into this upper room, there was someone missing because you see the practice was at this time that the host would set someone at the door to wash the feet of those who came into his house. And so you remember earlier in the text in John's Gospel where Jesus sent the, a couple of disciples in to prepare, find the room, set the room up, get ready for the Passover meal. Well, maybe they forgot, maybe they just assumed the owner of the house was going to provide the person to wash their feet, but that didn't happen. Most of you would know the phrase, I wish I was a fly on the wall. You know what that means. You want to just sit back and look and see what's happening. So this morning, I want you to kind of be that fly on the wall and kind of picture what's going on. Because as they gathered that evening for the Passover meal, as they began to come in, you could imagine that they were listening to the laughter of those, we're going to celebrate again the Passover meal with our teacher, with the Lord. And maybe the first disciple went up the steps into the upper room, and as he broached that door, he looked and Where's the servant? Where's the guy? Here's the basin. Here's the water. Did he ungird himself? Did he decide that he was going to be that servant to wash the other's feet? The table was in front of them about this high so that they could recline on the floor. Hey, nobody's at the table. I can get the choice seat. And so he goes and sits down. The next one comes up. Nobody there sees the guy at the table, his buddy, and says, you know, I'm going to get the closest seat I can to the Lord, too. I'm second in line here. And each one of them came up. Not a single one of them ungirded themselves. Not a single one of them put the towel around. Not a single one poured a single drop of water in that basin and did any servanthood ministry. Not one. They all took their place at the table with their stinking feet towards each other. And so the Lord gets up from the table. And he walks over to the basin and he pours the water into the basin. He had to be thinking as he was walking over there, come on, Father. You know, I've been with these guys for three years, and I've been teaching them, and I've been preaching to them, and they've heard me talk about this over and over. I've given them illustration after illustration. I've pointed to you, and that they're supposed to imitate me. Okay, one more time, Father. I know what tonight means. I know what tomorrow brings. One more time. So Jesus, Jesus washes the disciples' feet. He not only washed the 11, but he washed all 12. The one that would betray him later that night, he washed his feet too. Dirty, smelly feet. I want you to hear verse 13 through 17 again. Be that fly on the wall. Picture in your mind what's happening. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If then the Lord and the teacher washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do 
as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Jesus has called his disciples into a servanthood ministry. He has called them to serve, but not just serve. He has called them to be a servant. In his book, Richard Foster, who is from the Quaker tradition and a theologian and has written a book um, years ago called Celebration of Disciple, of Discipline, rather. And this is what he says. In some ways, we prefer to hear Jesus' call to deny father and mother, houses and land for the sake of the gospel, than his word to wash feet. Radical self-denial gives the freedom of adventure. If we forsake all, we even have a chance of glorious martyrdom. But in service, we must experience many little deaths of going beyond ourselves. Service banishes us to the mundane, the ordinary, the trivial. Tough words flies in the face to what many of us want to do when we are called to serve. There's a myriad of reasons why we don't like to serve. We think people will take advantage of us. We think that serving, well, if we're serving, why aren't others serving alongside of us? We think the work we have to do is beneath us. We stand in judgment of the person that we're supposed to serve. We just don't have the love within us, or maybe it's just this simple. We don't want to do it. You see, service comes in big and little sizes. It comes in different places at different times in different ways as we walk with the Lord in this call on our life in relationship with him. And so we are called to the discipline of serving. Serving first is a matter of the heart. Now think about this in this way. Many of you, and I know many of you, you are currently doing it, and some of you have done it in the past, and some of us may have to do it in the future. And that is serving a loved one, someone that needs your help. You don't think twice about it. You don't think twice about caring for that person that is ill a family member that needs you alongside of them to care for them, minister them, love them where they're at physically. We don't think twice about that. And in fact, we don't even consider it service. You committed to love that person in some way, whether it's family or friend, and you're willing to serve them. But folks, that's a matter of the heart. You love them in a way that you're willing to care for them. Jesus loved us because only through him are we healed. Only through him and his service to us can we fall into love with him. Jesus loved us. His desire is for us to love others, and to serve them in their need. And so first, service is a heart thing. Secondly, service is an act of obedience. We are called to serve. The purpose for us serving is 
to be less arrogant in our obedience, less prideful, less possessive, less envious, less resentful, and the list could just keep on going, all those fools. But the fact is, is through our obedience, we live into this spiritual discipline of service. I want us to look back to that verse 14 and 15 He says, now I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. You should wash one another's feet. I have set this example for you, he says, that you should do as I have done to you. One more time, Jesus is teaching in the upper room. One more time, he's giving them an example of what they should do, that they should be servants to one another. They should be helping, meeting the needs of one another. They need to be Christ-like, he says. Be like me. And if we are going to be like Jesus in humility, in serving, then we have to humble ourselves as servants of God. Paul says it this way. If you look at Philippians 2, in verses 3 through 7, Paul says... Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others, others better than yourself. Each of you should not only, should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. Let that sink in. Your attitude should be the same as Jesus Christ, who being the very nature of God, did not consider himself equality with God, something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. In these verses, Paul gave us a prescription of what it means to be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about it. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. Do nothing out of vain conceit. In humility, consider others better than yourself. Do not look out for your own interests, but look at the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as Jesus. Make yourself nothing and take the nature of a servant. Paul has given us what it means to be a servant of Jesus Christ. And as we think about these specific things that God has given us through his word, through Paul's writing, we need to think about in our mind what it means. What does true service look like? And first, through, true service comes through our relationship with God. In other words, our service comes by the prompting, by the strength of the Holy Spirit that lives in us. No matter how small the task we are called to, no matter how large the task is, God, through his Holy Spirit, will give us the power, will give us what we need. We don't seek lights. We don't seek attention. True service is for the approval of God, not the approval of man. It's free of calculations. We're not taking results of how many people come in, how many people are in this ministry. We are called by the Holy Spirit to serve him. We do not discriminate in its ministries. We serve all. However God has called us and wherever he has called us, we minister simply and are faithfully in ministry to the need of those that God presents to us. True service is a lifestyle. We live into what God has called us to, into the ingrained patterns that the Holy Spirit gives us. 
true service can even be and should be at times spontaneous. True service listens with tender ears, tender hearts of what is being said. And sometimes true service as we listen requires nothing back other than just listening. Being there. The one that may be dumped on so that someone can hear, be heard. True service builds community. It draws people together. It will bind them together. True service heals. And what I mean by that, it doesn't mean that you're the, the doctor or you have this great power and heal and they pass out and they're all stand up and they're well again. That's not what I'm talking about. You are a healer in just ministering, being there, helping them in whatever's going on. So service, true service, comes out of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And then true service comes out of the spiritual gifts that God has given us. Um, back in the winter, in the early spring, we talked during our adult Sunday school time on uh, spiritual gifts. And um, many of you took a spiritual gifts inventory, and you know what that spiritual gift that God has given you. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have a spiritual gift. You may not realize what it is, but you do have one or more. We all have at least one. Some have more. And those spiritual gifts are intended for you to use in service to God. And you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, I did that inventory, and I do not have the service side of all of that. So I'm out. I'm free. Nope. Doesn't work that way. All of the spiritual gifts are to serve. Now, some have a spiritual gift of serving, but all of the spiritual gifts are to serve. Listen to what Peter says in the fourth chapter. Starting with verse 8, he says, Above all, love each other dip deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. All for hospitality to one another without grumbling. And here is the verse. Verse 10, each one of you should use whatever gift he has received. See, whatever gift you have received to serve others. Faithfully administering God's grace in the various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do so not should do as one speaking the very words of God. If he serves, he should serve in the strength that God gives him, that God provides. So that, here's the key, so that in serving, you glorify God. You see, it's not about you. Even in serving, it's about God. It's about glorifying God in your service. So we serve because we love God. We serve because we love others. We serve out of obedience to God. We serve because we have a spiritual gift that God has given us. And there's just a couple of more reasons we serve. We serve because of gladness. You see, Psalm 100 verse 2 says, Serve the Lord with gladness. We serve because God has called us to be joyful. He has called us to be happy in service, not begrudging the service. He wants others to actually see that we want to serve God, and we want to use this gift for service. He wants us to be happy about lifting one another up. Now, when I'm doing premarital counseling, I try to tell our couples that you need to serve and lift up your spouse. And if both of you will do that, you will be surprised what happens in the marriage. Think about it. I'm going to do the dishes tonight. No, you're not. I'm going to do them. No, I'm going to do them. I want you to not do them. No. How, what if the arguments that happen in the house was over trying to lift the other person up? You serve the other person. 
often there's a lot of other reasons there's arguments but we need to be happy and we need to lift each other up if we lift one another up with our service then god is pleased and uh, what is it happy wife and there you go that's my mantra there's another reason this final reason is gratitude I said I wanted to talk just a minute about Mark. I said these two gospels, and we've talked about John. But in Mark's gospel, the 45th verse, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life for a ransom. Jesus understood that night what he was about to go through. That night and the next day, and as we look at Jesus and his example of servant leadership, we realize and understand that he was willing to leave heaven, the throne room, to come to this place called earth, to become fully human while fully divine. He was willing first to lay down the royal scepter and join the people, this smelly place of sheep. There's a book, a leadership book, called They Smell Like Sheep. And the premise of the book is servant leadership, and it talks about that a leader, a true leader, will actually get in the mix with those that God has called them to serve. You could take that and extrapolate it out. Those of you that have uh, businesses or you've served in business or you've been in leadership roles, you know what that means. Ted Lithgow and I have talked many times over the last 13 years about leadership and what it looks like to serve with someone and how you serve. And so we look at Jesus' example and he was willing to come and dwell among us. He was willing to come and dwell with the sheep and set an example. We too are called to do the same. But secondly, in this verse, we cannot miss that Jesus also ransomed himself. He came, says, to give his life for a ransom for many. This was part of his call to serve by his father. If you go back to Genesis 3.15, we know that there's a plan set in place. And Jesus was the plan. Jesus was the one that would be the ransom for many. He would take the sins of the world upon himself because the father loved us so much. His death on the cross was the ultimate gift of servanthood. By him. Folks, we are called to serve the Lord. We are called to serve the Lord, not out of guilt, but because he has called us to be in relationship. He has called us and commanded us to be obedient. He has called us to serve in relationship through gratitude and through this gladness. He has called us to serve him. We serve not, because, not to receive any type of gain, whether, rather we serve with humility because, because it leads to Christ's likeness. We serve to glorify God. That is why we serve. Father, thank you for your word and your call in our life to serve you. You have given us gifts to serve, and we want to do that. And I pray, Father, that we would be in the model of all of us in where can I serve? I want to serve the Lord. Where can you place me, Session, to serve? Instead of, I think I want to hide. I think I want to sit in, 
from afar. I know there's others that are more whatever than me and they can serve. Father, may we be the first with a happiness, a gladness of gratitude and obedience in serving you. May we develop this spiritual discipline in our life so that you would be glorified. Oh, Father, we pray this in your name.